Well, hey guys, it's Dr. Drake 63 You have heard me talk about many, many Smith and Wessons on this channel. This one is my favorite subject of uh, Project Gun videos. Ended up having it reblued. Uh, it's a great 357 model 19, and this is a dash five. So you've heard plenty about Smith and Wesson, but not too much about Dan Wesson. Now this is a, a model 15-2. It was manufactured by the Dan Wesson Arms Company in Monson, Massachusetts. Serial number indicates it's from the earlier versions of the 15-2, which came after the 12. And that opportunity to pick this version up with a four inch bull barrel, which is, it's called a bull barrel. It's basically just a full shroud protector and full, full underpiece like you might see on a Smith & Wesson 586 or a 686. But I had one of these. In fact, this, this was the subject of a, uh, a video I did earlier uh, where I talked about six guns that I wish I never let get away. I had the six inch version of this. So in 1968, Dan Wesson, who was the great-grandson of D.B. Wesson, who was the co-founder of Smith & Wesson, set on an adventure with a gentleman by the name of Carl Lewis, not to be confused with the track star, uh, who had worked at both Browning and Colt Firearms. And they set out to show the revolver world how this should be done. And... Uh, it's kind of an interesting history with Dan Wesson. They're currently owned by CZ USA. And uh, besides uh, their revolvers, which they have brought back in the 715 series and some others, uh, they're, they're better known for their 1911s. Uh, they tend to be on the higher end and, and they're well regarded. But in terms of the company, Dan Wesson Arms out of Monson, uh, Massachusetts, um, they've had kind of an interesting run. Unlike Smith & Wesson, unlike Colt to a lesser degree, their firearms were, were not widely adopted in uh, the law enforcement community. So uh, these guys were, were more about uh, what shooters like you and me typically uh, would buy. And one of the big things they did was, if you look real close, you can see um, that threaded ring around the barrel right above the lug there. Uh, one of the things that they did was come out with the concept of being able to change to different barrel lengths and uh, they sold the pistol packs. This one was not one of those kits, uh, although I can go on any number of places widely available are different length and different types of barrels I can get. Um, an eight inch that's vented. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, the heavy, which this is, which is basically um, uh, kind of comparable to a full underlug like you might see uh, on say, for example, a Smith & Wesson 586 or a 686. Um, known for their accuracy, and a lot of that has to do with being able to adjust the tension of the shroud uh, and uh, being able to readily gauge your headspace and things of that nature. Uh, these are firearms that uh, folks that are shooters definitely seek, um, but they're not necessarily renowned in the same same breath as say, one of the old Colt Pythons uh, or even some of the, the older Prelock Smith and Wessons. However, uh, I find these to be really good shooters. So when they had the opportunity to get this, I decided, hey, let's go for it going to show you some uh, some shooting footage right now and talk about that a little bit. So it's off to the range we go and uh, I've got some American Eagle 158 grain ammo I'm shooting 357 and uh, very soft shooting uh, very easy to stay on target you don't see a lot of muzzle rise but you're going to see in a second click click and no bang and then we skip to bang so we're seeing right there in double action that uh, we've got an issue where we're not striking all the primers. They're coming up, it's going to happen again. 
and I'm kind of right now just cycling through second time around. I guess the second time is a charm, but uh, I've got some thoughts about that uh, when that situation occurs. Here's a little bit more of a close-up. Again, this is double action shooting. No problem with the first one. Second round is fine. Third round is click. No bang. Fourth round good. Fifth round good. Sixth round good. And now I'm just kind of cycling hoping to get it again now what you're seeing me is pulling the hammer back every time in single action and uh, this worked out just fine so i've seen this before i've uh, got a video about a colt trooper mark three that had this issue and uh, i replaced the mainspring and issue was solved accuracy wise very happy with this you can see this shooting uh, again, soft shooting. We tried four different kinds of ammo, so I'm very sure that the issue is spring-related. So as I mentioned during my narrative uh, in the shooting footage, there were some problems with light primer strikes um, on, I don't know if it was a consistent cylinder, but it was consistently happening every time that I, that I loaded uh, the cylinder in double action only. Now, I don't like to dry fire stuff, but for purpose of this video, I want you to notice something. I want you to see how far this hammer goes back before it breaks in double action. Now I want you to compare that to how, how far it goes back in single action. It goes back uh, darn near a quarter of an inch farther and because of that the hammer is falling forward with a greater uh, amount of force than what you get with the single action pull which breaks right there instead of back there. Hopefully that's something you can see. Um, had this same problem on a couple different Colts, same kind of thing. They have a compression spring that we're going to show you in a minute uh, that's inside the, 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 the frame and the grip. And if you lighten that too up, up too much, what you end up with is a situation where you get light primer strikes. I suspect someone is at some point put uh, put a non-factory spring in here you can get uh you know tune-up kits and things to make it an easier pull um but my understanding on this gun is any mainspring that that gets below about eight pounds and you're going to flirt with this possibility and uh, that's what i believe has happened to this and we'll verify that when we send off for the right spring the factory spring on this is supposed to be nine pounds they're not readily available wolf doesn't sell them but I'm going to be able to, uh, I believe, get a hold of one of these uh, through CZ USA. I, I do believe they still stock them. One of the differences and one of the things that came up doing some research is, is if you over tighten this uh, grip screw, you might be actually compressing the spring a little bit because it rests inside of uh, the grip or the stock as we call it. So we're going to take this off and, and take a look and, and just get an idea of what we're going to be replacing. But that's definitely the first thing I'm going to do, and it's a relatively inexpensive part. Now you'll notice that this does take a hex head type of scenario. And we're going to loosen that up and go ahead and take that out, and we can kind of show you what's going on. One thing I'll mention, these grips, why they are somewhat expensive due to their scarcity, uh, are nothing too exciting to me. I, I, uh, I definitely uh, don't believe these are as beautiful as many of the, say, Smith & Wesson and cold grips, but I think we'll stick with uh, what we have. But you see we have this area right here, and your spring is inside of this particular piece. Also, as you can see right here, there's two hex head screws that I'll need to take off and take off this side plate in order to access the spring. And that piece comes right out just like that. So this is what it looks like with the side plate off. And you'll notice 
this piece right here rotates your cylinder and it's held in in part by this plate which I've taken off okay and so uh, for me to go ahead and work the various parts and show you how they interact things are going to want to pop out but uh, it's clear that I'm going to need to take this piece off this spring as well as your piece that contains the hammer uh, in order to go ahead and replace that uh, guide rod and that spring. But why that's so important is if your compression here is weak and your hammer isn't going to go far, as far back and double action, it's not coming forward with enough force. So uh, when you lighten that up too much, you end up getting light strikes and double action. And as I showed you earlier with the length of the hammer pull, uh, in single action versus double action, that it isn't as big a deal. So it's real important to uh, uh, make sure that it has a proper tension. So with less travel, it's falling with more force. Hopefully that makes sense. But um, you can see the internal internal uh, bar right here, which prevents uh, the hammer from falling and misfiring. You can see uh, various parts. This is the hammer return spring and coming over here you can see your trigger mechanism and your trigger spring. And this is a, a pretty cool look inside uh, a very good design. Um, I know like I can show you with like the Colts where you're able to just change out this mainspring here without taking any other parts off and that would be for the Colt Trooper. But uh, you know, you look real close before you take any of this stuff apart. You probably want to take some pictures. You probably want to make sure that you're in an area that if something goes popping out, that you're going to be able to find it. And I might go ahead and just replace some of the other springs while I'm in there, uh, being that this is a, a gun that's 40-something years old. But I thought that uh, this would be really cool to look at. Something else to show you, you look at uh, the blue job here and the part that was uh, has been under the target grip and the part that's not. You got some fading, you got some wear, probably from fingerprints like I just put on there. But also notice some redness, which is just a different phase of the bluing process, which is oxidation. And I noticed that on a couple of these parts. I also noticed that on the other Dan Wesson that I owned. I don't know if maybe what, what Dan Wesson did was blued parts maybe in different batches or something uh, and then assembled the guns. Uh, I'm not an expert on how these things are done, but you can see some differences in the pieces. And these are all original to this gun. So I don't know if Dan took a different approach or how that worked. You can kind of see here as well what's going on with that but we'll uh, we'll clean that up real nice and and put our uh, put our grips back on now one of the things I'm going to do with CZ is get them on the phone on Monday this is a weekend and verify that it is a nine pound uh, nine pound spring that they're gonna be including in the kit that they sell it doesn't indicate that on their website but that was the original factory, and something tells me that will take care of my issue. But you can kind of see in this light, at this angle, how this piece looks like it's almost kind of like a plum color. You know, that's not an effort to re-blue. That just is a different level of oxidation, which again, bluing is basically rusting a gun. And you rust it to the color you want. Now we know... And you can see a little bit of a contrast between the frame here and this barrel. We know these, these barrels are manufactured separately and then they're attached to the gun. So it's not like a Smith & Wesson or a Colt where they're going to basically do all the main parts together. And I think that's why you end up with this. I, I don't mind it at all. This is a shooter for me. I didn't buy this to put in a case and look pretty and and uh, show off on Facebook. I bought it to uh, to have a real nice shooting 357, which I think once we uh, we address that one issue, um, I will have a very nice shooting 357. There's no question about it. Um, but this is this is a beautiful firearm. 
uh, in its in its own its own way, and uh, it's not a Smith and Wesson. It's not a Colt. It's a Dan Wesson, three fifty seven model fifteen two, H, which stands for heavy barrel. You look at this non recessed cylinder on the Smith, and you can see that. Your rim right there is protruding by the thickness of the rim. And again, it is not in this recessed cylinder. Both Smith and Colt and most manufacturers put your cylinder latch back here. Here's your cylinder latch with the Dan West and it's up front. Some guys find that very unattractive. I can say I probably do prefer the cylinder latch in the rear because, you know, I'm so used to using my my right thumb to release it, but still, it's nice. Nice take on it. Gives you more clearance, I guess, for holding on to the firearm. My guess is, is that when Dan Wesson got in business, either for patent reasons or just for reasons of uh, wanting to have some uniqueness, um, they went with uh, with a, a cylinder latch that was up there. So at the end of the day, not a real big deal. As you can also see, it has adjustable rear sight, fixed front sight, and you've got uh, that matte finish on top of the receiver and on top of the barrel to cut down on any glare. So this came with the original box. It's got a parts diagram. It's got this rust inhibiting cloth that it came from the warranty and this really cool catalog of the pistol pack which i talked about so if you want to spend some extra money you can get alternate grips three different sizes of barrels as you can see here the traditional grip oversized target combat something called a sacramento Imagine to get some of those in good shape, you're looking at spending a lot of lot of money. The oversized target is what these came with, or what this one came with. And you can kind of see what was available at the time. The 14.2, the 15.2, the Vented Series, the 15.2H, which is what this is, the H standing for heavy barrel. And you can get the 15.2 VH, which stands for Vented Heavy Barrel. So you've got a lot of options there. Back in the day, when these things probably cost a ridiculously small amount of money. But it's kind of nice to have the original box. I mean, I'm going to keep this in my safe and, 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 and in a better situation than in a box. Uh, but uh, pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff all the way around. And uh, like I mentioned, I had a 15-2. I let it get away. Not going to make that mistake again, I don't believe. Flame cutting can be a problem because where your cylinder gap is, you've got the blast going up and it can eat away at your frame. And we don't see evidence of that here. And as I mentioned, you've got really no issues with erosion. It's Got a little bit of roughness around uh, that throat right there, but nothing that concerns me. And as always, it's nice to see a bright and shiny bore. One of the things I want to show you too is uh, the amount of pounds it takes to work this in both double action and single action. Um, it's probably going to be off the scale a little bit here on the on the double action. And I wasn't, I wasn't kidding you. It was somewhere around nine pounds on an eight pound scale. Well, let's, let's take a look at this in single action. That comes in very consistently at three and a half pounds. I measured that uh, more than once. So three and a half pounds on a, uh, on a single action uh, is very nice and light, and uh, and I'm fine with that. On the double action, you know, we all want it to be as light as possible, but uh, the biggest thing, like I said, I've seen with revolvers is when you do that, 
you're oftentimes going to have inconsistency on uh, your 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 primer strikes and let's face it some ammo has harder primer than others uh, some ammo has consistency issues with their primer. So um, if, if you're going to go down that road, just make sure you, 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 you test out different poundages of your springs. And like I said, for me, I'm fine with going with the factory, which is supposedly nine pounds for this gun. Now we just got to find one. For purposes of comparison, here's that Smith & Wesson Model 19. Let's see what that does in single action. That comes in at four. Pretty consistently at four. So not a huge difference, about a half a pound. But uh, I do plan on pursuing uh, finding some, some other uh, parts to this pistol pack. Um, the, the, the gap in between the barrel and the cylinder checks out really nice. In fact, they include a gap gauge in, in, your, uh, in your box when you get it. So... That's kind of cool too, but uh, uh, very nice wide target kind of hammer. Uh, the triggers are very beefy and, and, and very easy to access. And uh, overall, just in hand, this is a very, very nice uh, revolver. And I haven't, uh, I haven't been talking to you much about revolvers lately, and, and that's my bad because I think revolvers are absolutely cool. Um, they're reliable if you set them up right. I wanted to uh, point out one of the things that I see guys do, and not just revolvers, but with semis as well, is uh, they don't understand that the workings of the firearm uh, are an orchestration of parts, not just one part and uh, forget about the others. And in the world of springs, you'll often see a pack come together for a particular type of firearm, and there's a good reason for that. If you just lighten one spring incredibly, and don't compensate for it elsewhere, you can create problems. You can create problems with timing. You can create problems on a semi-auto uh, with, with uh, uh, all sorts of issues, feeding issues, everything else. So it's really important to do your, your homework. And in this day and age, there's no excuse not to because we all have uh, access to unlimited amounts of good information when it comes to firearms. Um, this one is nice. I like it. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed watching this video today. I'll keep you updated. We'll, uh, we'll put in some new springs. That might be the, the subject of a video as well as going and seeing if that did indeed uh, fix our issue with light strikes and double action. This is DR Drake 63 saying thanks for watching and have a great day guys.